So Seiya, the floor is yours right now. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the intro, uh, Margo. So a note for everybody, a disclaimer, it's 10 bucks a question. All right. And uh, Margo at the end is going to put the PayPal link there. So be careful asking questions. Um, jokes aside, um, welcome everybody. Uh, like, first of all, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, every time I start a, a presentation or talk to a large group of people, my whole idea behind this is to give you as much knowledge as I possibly can and kind of put that in a snack size, kind of like bite size, so you can actually take uh, it with you to your workplace and obviously implement those changes and try to make sure uh, that you get value out of the talk that you're, you, you're going to be getting today. So all your time that you're investing is worth it. I wanted to talk um, about sales. Like uh, <clears throat> like Margot mentioned, I, I don't do a lot of uh, conferences. Uh, that means that like the whole idea is that I'm working constantly or either or traveling and just trying to make sure that my topics or like talks are just offline. A lot of them are offline, just discussing it with a lot of people. Uh, a lot of salespeople have the good fortune of working with them or have the good fortune of actually talking to them and have those resources. So it's always good to kind of Rattle them, rattle them, shake them, and get ideas out of them, and of course share it to the general public how it works. So today's topic is to streamline your sales. Um, pretty generic, pretty huge, but I will try to give it my best shot to see if we can do that by the end of this webinar. Um, I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago, and at that time I did not have this presentation, and we were talking about revolution over evolution. So we know a lot of salespeople, we know a lot of marketers, PR people. And in that case, pretty much everybody or anybody who's a pioneer in their particular feed, uh, field, I've had the great privilege of speaking to them. So a lot of times when people talk, they talk about revolutionizing their uh, particular field or when they come into a company revolutionizing, uh, revolutionizing their whole uh, department, right? So I'll give you an example that a lot of consultants that I used to work in the past when I didn't have a lot of sales knowledge, they would come into an, into the company and start shaking everything, right? Like your whole qualification process is wrong. The way you're selling is wrong. Your pricing is wrong. Your your landing page is wrong. The leads are bad. You don't have an ideal customer profile. Your outbound strategy is bad. So they will start looking at all the faults that you have within within your your sales environment or within your within your company or department. So I'm strictly against the idea of revolution. I believe in evolution. I believe that people who make uh, New Year resolutions that they're going to go to gym and get to 8% body fat and start going to gym every single day and going to eat healthy and are going to be, you know, the best shape of their life in, in three to four months. It's just false narrative. It doesn't really work. Right? The majority of the times it just does not work. It's all about incremental change. It's all about <clears throat> step by step, right? So systematically taking baby steps to achieve your own goals. So evolution is always greater. Uh, than revolution so there is no one size fits uh, fits all right that if i were to tell you today that there is a book out there if you read um it's going to solve all your sales problems it just simply won't it, it's just it's, it's it's not it's not possible it's not true there is no one particular strategy that you can use in order to be able to get something out of this presentation or any other presentation in the world be that be any conference that you go to so let me save you the suspense and save you the money there is no one size fits all Always listen to everybody and anybody, be that be a sales expert, be that be me or anybody with a little bit of, you know, a lick of salt. So try to understand that this is your, you know, your company best. And that's the kind of strategies that have been working for other people. How can I apply that to within, uh, within my company or my department and get the most out of it? So before I begin or get into it, I want you to really understand that this is, of course, something that has worked for me in the past or has been working for me. Hopefully, it will continue to work for you, but it's all this work in progress. We try to be able to make sure that you're doing better, right? So it all comes down to evolution, step by step. Systematically make changes, not revolutionize things. It just won't work that way. Uh, so there is no magic bullet to solve all your problems. Like I said before, listen to advice, but tweak it according to your own situation that you're in. Because you know your company best. You know your sales processes best. You know your marketing side best. And you know and understand your product the best. Um, I wanted to talk a lot about sales velocity. Now, sales velocity is a topic that popped up 2012, I believe, or at least it popped up for me because that's when I really started getting into sales or at least B2B SaaS. And sales velocity was one of the hot topics back then. And it was kind of like a trend for four or five months, heard it in a lot of conferences, talked to a lot of people about it. I made a lot of presentations over it, listened to people, and I was surprised that this is such an interesting topic. It's something so basic, so naive, and people just don't focus on it. And it as soon as it came in, as fast it went out. 
it just went out pretty fast and people don't focus on it anymore. And I wanted to get back into it because I think it's a super cool way to be able to understand where you stand in in terms of sales and how you could actually get better and obviously make changes in order to be able to make sure you continue to do better. So in a nutshell, sales velocity shows you how quickly leads are moving through your pipeline and inadvertently how fast you're making money, right? So every business wants to make money and you also want to make sure the leads as quick as they come, as as quickly as possible, they go through our, our pipeline on our phone and of course turn into paid customers, right? So the less time it will take prospects to go through your pipeline, the faster you will close deals. That is music to the ears of every sales manager slash CEO slash co-founder slash COO in the world, right? And like you want to be able to hear those kind of like that kind of rhetoric. Right? So the whole idea behind sales velocity is to be able to make sure you're quickly moving the leads, prospects through your funnel, right? And making money faster. Um, let's move on. So there are four, only four factors that will impact how much you sell. Now, There are tools out there. There are strategies out there. So this is not anything to do with strategy. These are just four factors. Like I know that when it gets hot and the steam goes to the cloud, it condensates and you get rain. I know that for a fact that there are certain factors that impact how you sell, right? So they don't change. Of course, tools can change. Strategies can change. But these four factors impact how much you're going to sell, right? So one is the number of opportunities you're going to work on. So the sales opportunities or deals that some people call it. The average deal value that could be in an MRR, which means is that if you sell somebody a license or your tool for a year for $1,200, MRR or monthly recurring revenue is $100 per month. And ARR, the annual recurring revenue is $1,200, right? Because that's the whole cost that they're paying for the year to be able to use your product. Third is your win rate. That means Amount of deals in your pipeline times the amount of deals that you have actually closed, right? So if you have 10 deals in your pipeline and you close three a month, or you have 10 deals in your pipeline a month and you close three, that's 30% of your is your win rate. And rest, of course, is your loss rate or unknown status, right? And the length of your sales cycle. How long does it take for you to actually close a particular deal, right? Is it a day, a month, a year? If your enterprise, probably it's longer than three months. Most probably it's longer than six months, right? So the whole idea is you have to get like a dividend a median number for that in order to be able to work on these factors. So the four factors are these, and that's the sales velocity equation. I love math. I also suck at it, but it's also good for me to be able to look at it because this equation in itself is a mathematical equation of sorts, right? And that's what it looks like. It's opportunities, so the deals, times deal value. So that means is it a thousand dollars, thousand zwote, or a thousand pounds? times the win rate, meaning what's the percentage of the win rate, right? Is it 10%, 20%, 50%, 60%, uh, and divided over the length of cycle. So the A, B, C, D gives you sales velocity. So these are three particular uh, aspects or three factors up there divided over the length of your sales cycle, right? Um, pro tip, sales focus, uh, salespeople should focus on increasing these particular functions up here and always focus on decreasing the functions below the line. Below the line, meaning the length of the sales cycle, you want to be able to make sure that you're decreasing, right? As fast you're closing deals, the better it is for you. Let's work it in a little more detail in terms of how sales velocity actually works and what kind of status or health status it gives you of your business. So in layman's terms, so in simple terms, you want to increase A, B, C, D, which I just showed you. And, oh, sorry, excuse me, A, B, C, and you want to reduce D. Reduce D, by that I mean, of course, the sales cycle, right? You want to be able to make sure you're reducing that. So this is on the top of the line. This is below the line. To give you an example, if you manage to increase A, B, C by 10% and reduce D by 10%, so reduce the sales cycle by 10% and, of course, increase the win rate, uh, your average deal size, and, of course, the time it takes, excuse me, uh, yeah, if, if you do that, then you can increase your sales velocity by 48%. What I mean by that is that if you're able to increase the top factors or the top functions by 10% and increase the lower factor, which is the sales cycle, by 10%, you can actually increase your sales velocity by 48%, which means that that is an additional revenue coming to your bank account in or in terms of just revenue without having had, having to add a single salesperson to your team, right? So just I was trying to work it out today this uh this formula on my own to try to see how it would work and if you can see here um this is the formula that we are talking about and here at the bottom you can see 
10% increase here, 10% increase here, and 10% increase here, right? And the 10% decrease in the sales cycle, it can give you 148% of the 148% increase, right? So 100% obviously being there for 48%, of course, is the additional increase that you're going to get in your sales velocity. So basically, simply put, in layman's terms again, you increase your revenue um, by 48% without adding a single salesperson to the team, which comes back to like one of those talks I have regularly with people, right? It's not about hiring new people. It's about optimizing your current process because if you optimize your current process, it's much more easier for you to be able to gain more clients, gain more revenue, but also make sure that you have sustainable client base, right? So with that formula, which is pretty simple and you can take a look at it, how it looks like, it gives you a general idea of that if you just increase numbers by a very small percentage, how quickly and how greatly it will increase your revenue without having to go fish out for your talent. But we're going to work on that in a little more detail in, in just a few minutes. So let's take a look at some real made up numbers, right? So your business has 100 opportunities, um, an average win rate of 25%, and an average deal size is around $5,000, right? Of course, these are just numbers, but you can tweak that on your own. But just for the example's sake, we're going to stick to these. And the sales cycle lasts around 90 days. So let's calculate the sales velocity of your business. All right, so sales velocity, I'm so sorry for my writing. It's pretty bad, I know. So we have 100 opportunities times the win rate, which is 25%, so 0.25 times the deal value, which is $5,000, right? We have that number, and we're dividing that over 90, right? So mathematically speaking, let's finish the brackets first. Under is done 25, that's 12.5 times 5,000 is 125,000, right? So 125,000 divided by 90 equals $1,388, right? Now let's move on and let's see what that number really means. What's the conclusion? So the conclusion is that $1,388 is your sales velocity, which means you're roughly bringing in that much revenue every single day. Why every day? Because you're dividing it times the, your sales cycle that is of the average, right? And your sales cycle average is around 90 days. So 90 times 1,388 is, of course, going to total up to a number that is $125,000, right? So now with this information at hand, you can either increase the numerator. So in math, the numerator is the one that we're dividing uh, for. And, of course, the denominator is the one that we're dividing against which in the numerator sense here is the 125,000, that is your revenue. And or what you can do is decrease the denominator, which is the 90 days, which is your sales cycle. Uh, and you wanna be able to make sure you reduce it as much as possible. Um, you can either do this or you can either do that. But a lot of sales teams, what they do is that they try to make sure they increase the, uh, increase the numerator and decrease the numerator uh, uh, denominator at the same time, right? I know it's a little complicated, but if you look at the formula, once again, it's a pretty simple formula. You can try it out and see how it fits in terms of your business, right? What's your sales velocity? And of course, after that, you just have two numbers you have to focus on. One is, of course, the money you're bringing in, and other is the time it takes for you to close new business. You have to reduce the time it takes for you to close new business and increase the money that you're getting from your clients, right? We're going to work on that in just a few minutes in detail. Um, why the equation matters and why is it that it's something that is not very uh, mainstream? Right? So if it is so important, why isn't everybody um, using it or why is it everybody, anybody not talking about it? So the whole idea is that there is different ways to measure your sales health. There is different ways to measure your business health. And of course, there's different ways to take a look at things, right? A lot of people focus on KPIs. A lot of people focus on OKRs. They're all good stuff. But the idea behind something like this as an equation is that it's pretty simple and it gives you an understanding right away in terms of numbers. So it's a powerful way to gauge the health of your sales team. That's one. You want to be able to make sure how your sales team is doing, right? And you want to do that periodically. If you have um, quarterly reviews with your sales team, it's always good to do that in the start of the quarter so you can see exactly what the health of a sales team is, right? You don't have to go much in detail. And this information is readily available. If it's not, then you're doing sales wrong. You want to be able to make sure that basic primal information is at your disposal at any given time for you to be able to work numbers and try to make some sense out of it. There is no BS involved. So there is no bullshit. It's all a numbers game. Sales is a numbers game. This equation is a numbers game. And that number gives you exactly a number to give you an understanding of your sales team or your health of your business. 
you can pick any of those functions and try to improve. The results will show up instantaneously. By instantaneously, I mean in sales terms, um, within a quarter, you will see improvement, right? If you're seeing improvement, that is, of course, it's a win-win for you and your business. Fourth, it's easy to benchmark against other teams. Now, one of the things that I readily do is that I talk to the salespeople. If I don't get the chance, I always talk to people and try to make sure how they're doing. I don't understand how they're doing stuff. Sometimes they're using a different strategy. Sometimes they're using a different tool. A lot of times they're just in a different market, right? So the whole idea is that I like to benchmark it to see how other people are performing in my industry so I can stay on top of my own, right? So it's always good to kind of benchmark it. And with that equation, it's pretty simple to be able to benchmark. Uh, fifth, it helps you forecast your sales more accurately and optimize for the future. Now, you can forecast your sales, of course, based on this equation. But if you add the improvement percent, so let's say the improvement is 4% or 8%, then you can extremely accurately gauge based on if everything remains unchanged based on this particular equation in three uh, months from now or half a year from now, this is exactly the amount of revenue, MRR, ARR, or, or the or the salespeople I would need, right? So this gives you a better understanding so you can optimize for the future, which is half of the sales game. How to increase your sales velocity. So now we talked about what sales velocity is. Now we talked about why is it beneficial. We talked about why companies should be using it. And then of course, why it needs to be there in the first place. Let's talk a bit more about how do you can increase it, right? So there's various different ways you can increase your sales velocity. And they primarily fall into three categories. Improve your conversion rate, optimize the deal size, shorten your sales cycle. One more is increase the number of deals. But the idea about deals is that I will talk about it in, in, in a little bit, but is that if you're increasing your deals without them having to be qualified or if they actually can or have a mutual fit with your business and you're putting them in your opportunity case, then it's not really a good way to kind of go ahead. Why? Because there is more clutter in your pipeline. There is, there is a lot more deals that you're focusing on, but they might not have a lot of chance of closing, right? Which is a very... A very, very, very uh, big dilemma that a lot of salespeople are in, and then we always make this particular mistake, right? So the idea is to be able to tweak around these three things, and you can manage and greatly increase, of course, your sales velocity, right? So let's talk in a little bit more detail in terms of what those are. How do you improve your conversion rate? Right? Always qualify your leads. I mean, this is the basic, right? A lot of people get one thing wrong, or most of the people I talk to, if they go on a conference or they're going for a webinar or reading a book of sales or anything, they think that if they read that book, by the end of that book, they will somehow revolutionize the way they do things. They will somehow completely change the way they're doing things, and it's going to be super, super great for them, and they're going to get a ton of value. It's not true. It all starts from the basics, right? You systematically make changes. You can't expect to go to the gym and start benching. 150 pounds, it's not possible, right? You have to make sure your muscles get to a certain point where they can withstand that kind of weight. So the whole idea behind that is to be able to gradually make changes and stick to the basics. And basics are always qualify your leads, right? Be that be banned, that's one way to do it, but that's not the right way to do it. That is was a popular way to do it in maybe 2007, 2008. But then the stock market crashed and SaaS kicked in. So the idea was that you want to be able to make sure that you're changing your qualification a little more, right? The consumer is much more smarter now, much more tentative now, has more um, knowledge available very readily on their fingertips, right? With the use of a simple click, with that be a Google or a smartphone, right? So they have much more information available. You want to be able to make sure you're not getting too excited and try to learn about their pain point, try to understand what exactly is it that they're looking to do with your tool, product, or service? If you have a consulting business, try to do that. That very thing, right? So if you let them speak, chances are they're going to answer all of your questions and then some. And you will have more ammunition to be able to use later on in the follow-ups, emails, calls, right? So once somebody gave me a very, uh, like a tip once, and they told me that salespeople suffer from a disease called situational amnesia. And it holds so true. If I wasn't recording my calls, half the shit I say probably will not be, I would not remember it later on. It's just the way it is. It's just situational amnesia. You're, if you're talking a lot and you're not taking a lot of feedback and not making notes, you are prone to forgetting things. And if you're going to forget things, that's something might be the difference between a customer that you might have gotten and a customer you might have lost, right? So you always try to make sure that you get, uh, don't get too excited and learn about their pain points and try to see if you can help them, of course, uh, with your product and if there is a mutual fit, all right? So start, try and stay away from the band qualification, like what is your budget, and try to be more human in terms of the way you're talking. 
building a relationship, learning, and giving interest in their business, high percentage chance that people are going to be more prone towards buying your product because people buy people that don't buy a product most of the times. Unplug your pipeline. So in terms of improving conversion rate, right? Like I said before, a lot of salespeople just look at opportunities as the only metric or thing to worry at. If it's qualified lead, it's not super interesting. But if it's an opportunity and we have sent the pricing and there's a proposal, automatically it turns into a lot of dollar signs in our front in front of our eyes and we get all energetic and surprised, right? You want to be able to make sure you're not creating those deals. That you're not creating deals out of every single demo you do. Just make sure you try to unplug your pipeline that you currently have. It's easier to kind of retain the new customer, easier to kind of work through your own pipeline than to go ahead and get a new customer because it's going to add to the more timeline. Time you're going to spend, excuse me, on uh, on your on your sales cycle. Time it's going to be for them to make a decision. Time for them to to actually go ahead and give a positive answer to you. So remove clutter from your pipeline, only create opportunities from leads you're fully qualified and there is a mutual fit. And you know that they are fully qualified and there is a mutual fit, trying to make sure you only go ahead with that. So you don't have this false sense of impression that at the end of the month, I'm gonna close this and this and that deal. But deep down, you can't bullshit yourself because you know those deals are simply not gonna close, right? Because they're just, just clogging your pipeline and give you vanity numbers or metrics that you'd like to focus on. Um, another uh, topic here uh, in terms of improve, improving your conversion rates, analyze your pipeline and for leaks that need patching, right? What that basically means is that you want to be able to make sure that every now and then you sit back and look at your pipeline, see exactly what's going on, look at your sales process, see where the conversions are dropping, where the prospects going silent. I know we're all busy with our work, there's leads to go after, there's demos to do, there's proposals to send out, there's accounts to create, but it's always good to go get an eagle eye view of what's going on and try to give as much information, try to look for as much information as you possibly can and then plug those leaks. Because if you can't do that, there's a very high percentage chance those problems are gonna keep on getting bigger and bigger, right? That's what happens. Uh, going silent is the worst. You spend time and energy building that relationship and if you don't learn anything from it, just devastating and time loss. What I mean by that is that a lot of time what happens is that we create deals or we're talking to people and they just go silent. You follow up, follow up, follow up. You thought you're going to close them next week and there's going to be money in the account, but they just go silent, right? So silent is the worst thing you want to do, like that they can do to you. So the whole idea behind not unplugging your pipeline and making sure qualified leads go ahead is so you can actually just spend time on those leads, the ones that you know that you can help and actually have some kind of ammunition to later use on and try to get an answer out of them in terms of why they've been silent. And don't be Wolf of Wall Street on them. Just be very civil and human and try to understand what was the reason why they're not, they're not responding. Chances are 80% of the time they're gonna get back to you and that's the information that you can go back, put it in your process, use and try to be able to make your process get better, right? So always analyze your pipeline and see exactly where the leaks are. Nothing is perfect, it's never gonna stay perfect. The idea is you continuously work towards it and just try to stay, make it better and better day by day incremental changes um and be honest with yourself about where you stand right like in terms of in terms of conversion it's it's, it's super 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 important is that you you want to be able to make sure <clears throat> that you're being honest with yourself where you're standing right now i know a lot of salespeople that are that are very qualified and they're they're they just happen to be much more advanced than where i am have more success under their belt but Oftentimes, they're just not honest with about themselves where they stand, right? So the first step of solving a problem is realizing there is one, right? And where nobody's perfect. Like I make mistakes on the sales on a daily basis, but what I try to do, however, is try to get better at it every single day, right? Trying to make sure that this is where I am. I need to do be better at this. And I need to be very, very, very good at following up. I just sometimes suck at it, but that's my, uh, that's my view of how I'm doing it. So the idea is be honest where you stand, look at the numbers, review them, try to make changes, and of course, Go with that, right? So you want to be able to make sure you're evaluating your performance, keeping track of your KPIs and look for trends. Oftentimes, the trends will tell you exactly what's what's happening, where, where you're standing. And if it's just a slump because people aren't hollered there, is it because something is just going on wrong with the sales process? And just go with that. Pro tip, a simple spreadsheet with OKRs and KPIs will suffice. You don't need a fancy tool for that. Somebody once told me, and it was ironic because I sell a tool. We all, well, often in SaaS are selling some kind of solution. And he told me, um, if you need a tool to succeed, you've already failed, right? So the idea is that if you can't keep those numbers and everything and all those trends and everything in one place and not having to pay for it, 
Yeah, that would be the best way going forward, right? Like you want, you don't need a complex tool to tell you MRR, uh, MRR KPIs and everything. You just want to have to make sure you have a simple spreadsheet and has all the details and you look at it and of course reflect back to see where you currently stand. Uh, how to optimize the deal sites, right? So that was the second thing that we wanted to talk about in terms of increasing your sales uh, velocity. So how to optimize the deal size? Um, improve understanding of your prospects business. Um, when I was a salesperson four, five, six years ago, I had one goal. Um, at that time, Wolf of Wall Street was pretty new. Garden Gecko was pretty new. The idea was to shove the product down the client's throat. Like if you can close somebody on a phone call, you're a legend, right? I mean, that's how you do it. So the whole idea was to just try to get that product in, in the person's throat and get them to pay, right? Not understanding what the hell they do, not understanding why they need it, not understanding why should they give a crap about our product or about our product roadmap or anything, just sell, 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 right? I was in a, such a predatory sales mind, uh, probably because I was cold calling the hell out of people in the United States and Canada, and that was my job, right? So it was you have to be a wolf in clothes to sheep's clothing. So I never had that understanding, and I, I think I lost the most there, right? Because if you're not understanding your prospect's business, chances are they're going to buy right now, but they won't stay with you for the next six months, after six, nine months, right? They're going to understand that this is something that is not going towards where their business is going towards. And if your both paths are not paths are not aligned, there's a hundred different tools that they can go after and just go and buy. It's that simple. So it's very important you understand your prospect's business. If you understand their business and pro tip, you understand your business and domain or terrain, chances are you're going to sell the hell out of it, not by being predatory, but by simply understanding what exactly they're looking for. And look for, look for those small opportunities, those windows of opportunities where you could help with their business. It's nothing, like I said, nobody ever bought a tool because it's going to revolutionize their sales business or sales team. It's already doing okay. If they're getting clients and have a business on its own, on their own, that means they're doing okay. It's just they need to do better. So the whole idea is that if you have understanding of their business and you have understanding of your own business, that is a very potent mix where you can actually connect and of course sell them the vision. They're going to stay longer with you. And somebody as somebody once told me, it's easier to retain your, your customers than to go out and get a new one. So you want to be able to make sure that you're selling them the vision as well, not just in the product as is right now. So always try to understand your prospect needs, their business challenges, so you don't leave additional money on the table. That is a rookie mistake. I am a victim of it. I've made that a, a lot of times. I did make that in the start of my career, but that's one thing I would recommend never do. Cross-selling. That's very, um, it doesn't really, now it's not applicable in a lot of cases. And I was kind of like over the fence on it. Like I wanted to put it and I didn't want to put it, but I strongly believe in it. If you have a product, which I did, in terms of like that we're selling a range of different uh, aspects of tools. So be that be web analytics or uh, be that just be user experience tools. The idea is that, sure, they came to your website and the whole intention was to get tool A. That's fine. That's not a problem. But coming back and connecting to the point of learning more about the customer's business or prospect's business is that if you know their business and you can see there's a potential for them that they could get benefit from tool C and not the B, that's great. Pitch that in, see if they like it, right? The idea is to make sure you understand their business enough so you can see the windows of opportunities that they can, right? And try to plug that in to see if they will go with that. Chances are if they're buying that for $10 a month to lay and the other tool costs $10 a month too, that's $20 right there, right? But if you didn't pay attention or you didn't focus on their need or you didn't know how to sell your own goddamn tool, that's $10 lost, right? That That's $10 lost on one particular customer. That might be $10 lost on 10 other one times that by 12 because they, let's say everybody pays yearly. That's 120 a customer times that. That's 1,200 for 10 customers, right? That's the one we can estimate right now. But the idea is that the costs are much more higher or bigger than you might expect. Always try to see if there are patterns that the customer has and if there's other part of your products that they can use and actually get benefits from. It's your fiduciary responsibility to, to tell them like, how they can increase their business, right? They're coming to you, they're hotly. Get in there and try to make sure that they, you can give them value, right? Uh, or any aspect of the tool can give them value. Um, the other one is offer strategic discounts. I don't offer discounts, I used to, when I was a, <laughs> when I was a wolf on the Wall Street salesperson because I wanted customers, I wanted them ASAP. I did not care how they came. I'd give 20% off, I'd give a 30% off, and I just wanted customers because I was commission going straight in my pocket. 
I've learned and I have evolved as a salesperson. And I, I believe that B2B cannot, should be a lot like B2C. It's like going to Benihana and buying a dinner and they say it's $700, right? For a dinner of, I don't know, seven people and you got the drinks and you say, hey, you know what? If you knock 10% off, I'll pay it right now. No, you have acquired a service and now you have to pay for that service, right? So the whole idea behind discounts, I really don't get, right? I mean, we shouldn't give discounts. It's should be like it's in B2C. You're not going to a street vendor, you're going to a company that has a good tool. A lot of companies use it. And you don't need a lot of validation if you already have customers. If you already have customers, you're getting value and they're getting value out of your tool, you don't need to give a discount, right? Somebody can muster up a couple of hundred dollars and try to try to buy your tool if it actually is giving you value. But then again, it connects to the same point I used earlier or said earlier, is that try to be able to make sure that you're actually giving value by understanding their business and having your own business that, that understands, and you, excuse me, you understand your own business and you also understand what they're doing and trying to connect and align paths there, right? Um, I have added a pro tip here. Be careful while offering discounts. Offer them if you firmly believe that a 10% or whatever number discount will be the difference between yes or no. They're all always clients like this. I always take it on a user to user basis or customer to customer basis. General rule of thumb, I don't offer discounts. But if there's somebody I really want as a customer, it's a bad month or something, I will contradict myself here. Is that and really it's 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 a 10% discount and they're gonna go with us if you give them, they're not gonna go with us if you don't give them. Depends to be really honest how I feel. There's no system in place in order to be able to gauge that. But I would say stay away from the discounts, don't make a habit out of it. But of course, every now and then if there is an opportunity for you to acquire a customer and you really like them and you really think they can get value out of it and the money is the only thing, go ahead with the 10%. It's, it's not going to harm you, but don't make a habit out of it. Um, the last but not least, uh, the third aspect, which is shortening your sales cycle. Now we talked about increasing the deal size. We talked about increasing the conversion. Let's talk about the last one, which is how to shorten your sales cycle, right? Now, Let's go into it. Try and break down the sales process. Um, I see a lot of people talking about lead qualification. Then it comes to a demo. Demo turns into a proposal. Proposal turns into an opportunity. Opportunity turns into a closed one or a closed loss. And then you get a reason out of it. Sure, that's an overview of what's going on. But that's not what's going on in, 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 in total, right? But if you look at an SDR's job, their job is to get a lead, call, qualify, email, follow up, qualify, if not qualify, call, email, qualify, right? So there's a lot of things happening within that particular, like a silo of work, right? So you wanna be able to make sure you break your work down, right? Pretty simply, break it down to, oh shoot, my hand just got lost. You break it down into different steps, right? So look for the bottlenecks in your sales process. That means breaking it down, understanding, and reviewing where the drop is. Where do customers or prospects stop responding? Um, where are they going silent? Why are, are they mostly are stalling? I guarantee you, if you're dealing with as much leads as I am dealing with, you will start to see trends pretty fast. You will see it's all, mostly after the first, after the qualification call, they're not replying for a demo. It's an example. Why could that be? Because you're not qualifying them properly. Or maybe it's not because the leads are bad. Leads are fine. They will find way before you join the company. They're going to be fine long after you're gone. The idea is what you're going to do with the resources you have at hand, right? So see and look for the drop-off points. See and look for the trends where exactly everything is going wrong. Try to fix that. Don't revolutionize. Don't fix the whole process at once. Start from the bottom. Take it all the way to the top, right? Don't go. Don't try to reverse engineer this. This is not a Gary Vee sales pitch. Right? This is just a simple systematic sales process that you want to be able to make sure you look for a low-hanging fruit, which usually is at the top of the funnel, and then just start your way, all, start your work all the way down, right? But try to break down, take a have an overview of what's going on with the trends, and just focus on that. Um, second, in terms of increase shortening the sales cycle, automate where you can. I, I'm a strong believer of not automating when it comes to enterprise. You shouldn't. It's kind of like it's 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 predicated to my like kind of my core is that if somebody's willing to give you a hundred thousand dollars worth of business, the least they can you can do is just reply them with 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 some value, right? Like reply them out manually. But that's just kind of like my own thing. Anybody can do everything. I usually say do what works for you. If it doesn't, look for a change. The good idea is to try to automate a follow up because oftentimes I'm not in office or I have a meeting. I forget about following up. And what happens is that it's just a, it's, it causes a delay. 
delay turns into a delay on a Thursday, Friday, you say, forget it. They're not going to reply anyway because they're too excited for the weekend. And that turns into a three, four day loss. And then you have to go shift on to the next week. Try to automate where you can, but in little ways. But remember, in, in terms of enterprise deals, I'd never recommend sending an automated email. But if you really have to, because you're working with a lot of deal size, excuse me, a lot of deal flow, then I would recommend adding value, clear value to the prospect and having a very well-defined call to action. Now, I would recommend adding a call to action one way or the other in each and every single email. And I would definitely recommend adding value to each and every single email. But specifically in the case of, let's say, since this is something I feel very personal about enterprise, try to make sure you go the manual route. If you can, that's great. If you can, try to automate where you can, but not all the way, right? Essentially, like I said, people are buying people and the human workflow is always, is always better than a computer. It just makes you more invested in your leads. That's just my way of doing it. Uh, keep qualifying the, pro- uh, the prospects. I've seen people qualify once and that's interesting because our sales funnel never says qualification, demo, qualification. It says qualification, demo, proposal, opportunity. Now, there should be a big bracket on the side saying qualification, always qualify your prospects. You may never know the person you're talking to leaves the company. You may never know the need might change. You may never know the budget doesn't get a green light. You may never know their goals might change. Hell, the company might get acquired by a different company. And their whole strategy just changes. Always try and qualify. You will save a lot of headaches and pain. And as let's say estimating and forecast if you just keep qualifying the prospect or a customer. If you're qualifying them continuously, hey, are we still on for this? Are we still on for this? Are we still going for that? You said that you send that particular you know document decision in terms of agreement a contract to your ceo is he still on for it when is the chat scheduled or when it's a call scheduled the idea is just to stay on top of them right always stay on top of your deals i know it's easy to just brush it under the rug and go hey forget it they said in two weeks you'll give me the decision it's easy to be reactive to things it's very difficult to be proactive on things and i know that because i am a victim of one of those things but if they say two weeks, it's a good idea to reach out to them a couple of times in two weeks just to see if you can get an answer quicker. There is no harm in trying. There is no harm in trying and telling them, hey, when you reached out to me, you requested a demo. It took you 40 seconds to fill out a form. That's 40 seconds of precious time that you spent filling out a goddamn form. There must be some kind of a need that you have, right? And you were all super excited, honky dory, on a call. And all of a sudden, you know, there's two weeks delay. Now, try to get on top of them. If there is somebody that needs a tool or has a block or a bottleneck and they only can be sold by your product or excuse me, your service, go right ahead, stay on top of them. Keep reminding them that ammunition, use that, know their business, which I keep bringing that that point is that if you know the prospect's business and if you know their business inside out or try to understand their scenario in which you can apply your product and just go it from there, it's very useful for you to be able to use that later on in the stages of sales cycle where they just go silent or there is nobody that giving you an answer. All this stay on top of that and keep on qualifying until your time breath, until they become a customer. Um, bottom line. So yeah, these are the three things we just we, we talked about, right? In terms of shortening sales cycle, increasing the conversion rate and um, and of course, talking about the deal value, how you can increase that. Bottom line is that if you grow, ignore your sales velocity and blindly focus on keeping your pipeline full, a lot of salespeople do that. You'll have tons of leads, but not enough resources to move them through the pipeline, right? And then convert them. You will it just, it will hurt your bottom, uh, bottom line or it will hurt your bottom of the funnel, right? You want to be able to make sure that you are looking at these numbers. You are only putting the pipe opportunities that you know or have a very high chance of believing that they were close, right? That will, excuse me, ultimately solve all of your problems, right? The conversion rate, the deal size, the sales cycle, the, the number of deals that are passing through. So once you start measuring sales velocity, you will have the data and, and, and insights necessary to optimize your sales process from start to finish. Now, by no means, I say this is the only way to do it. I know there's a... 20 different way of looking at sales. There's hundreds of different KPIs that you can monitor depending on how complex your business is, depending on where exactly you're sell- selling, depending on what exactly are you selling. But this is one of the ways which are very quick and easy to be able to give you a snapshot of your health of the business, right? By no means one-off calculation is going to give you everything you need to know. No, if, but if you do calculate today, like to say, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second best time is now. 
But if you do calculate it today, try to make sure you keep monitoring them in, 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 in intervals, right? To so see exactly how, how it keeps on going. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? If it's decreasing, what do we need to do? What did we change? So let's unchange it and see if it comes back to that number. That means that's something that not, does not need to be done, right? The idea is fail forward, right? You want to be able to make sure that you focus on that and try to optimize your sales velocity. Now, change won't happen overnight. Like I said, don't go guns blazing, create a plan, then execute it one step at a time. If something doesn't work, go back to the drawing board, tweak it, and go do it again, right? Do not give up. The whole idea is that I just hired a consultant. I invested two, three months of my time, invested a lot of money in it, and he gave a lot of changes, but the changes are not happening. You don't just throw it all up, right? Because that's Three months of your time gone, that's a lot of deals probably gone or leads gone and a lot of money and resources and energies you put into it. No, go ahead and change that, right? You probably hired them for a right reason in the first place. So try to be able to work through their process rather than just try and overhaul this because you're not going to get that time back. Be patient, go back, change, tweak, go do it again. Don't just, don't give up. Closing points. Um, so we talked a lot about inbounds. Appan doesn't really get a lot of love these days. It's just super difficult and it's a pain in the ass for everybody to do. But I will just put in closing notes. It's a very close relationship with Appan. It does work if done correctly and with the process in place, right? But please, please, if you're in sales or in marketing or have a company, don't create email campaigns and use the spray and pray technique. Just don't simply do that. Don't do it. It works sometimes, but that's not a right way of doing it, right? Have a system. Very seldom do we lose a prospect because we're not using a particular tool. And if you're losing a deal because of a tool, then you don't know how to sell, right? Then you're a tool yourself. It's very seldom does it happen that somebody loses a deal because we don't have a particular tool in place, right? Like I said, a person says, if you need a tool to succeed, then you already failed. It's all about the process you have in place and it's all about execution, right? Build the process, execute it. But in terms of outbound, try to make sure that you're having a systematic approach and not just you know, having getting these lists from somewhere from data.com or any other platform, putting them in a tool like MailChimp or Outreach.io or whatnot, and just blasting the hell out of them with a, with a different template. Don't do that. Respect yourself, but most importantly, respect, respect your sales ethic, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very fine profession and it works great. I mean, it's your, like I said, it's your fiduciary responsibility to kind of pitch it to your product to somebody that would value out of it, but don't use it in a way that it kind of like, it's a blasphemy for the rest of us uh, salespeople, right? So you want to be able to make sure that you have a systematic thing in place. If it works for you, be my guest. Go ahead and do more of it. I have yet to meet a person or a company that is, has a better success rate than a 1% reply rate or out of the, all the emails that they send in terms of spray and pray, 1% being a 1% positive reply rate, right? So if it does work for you, go right ahead. In my experience, it doesn't try to make sure that you're tweaking it with a proper process and having an investing time to actually reach out to people, right? It always shows up. That value always shows up in an email or any kind of reach out you do. <laughs> Last but not least, don't masturbate to ideas in the head. I am a victim of this as well. If you read, don't just read books, attend conferences or webinars. Uh, and that's probably not a gateway to market myself. But don't do it for the sake of doing it. I don't attend a lot of conferences. I certainly don't give too many speeches. The idea is just don't do it for the sake of doing it because you think that it's going to A, revolutionize, B, it's going to completely overhaul your company. Just won't. Don't know something, figure out what it is, what your pain point is, just like you do it towards the lead. Then research, find resources that can help you get educated on that particular subject. Like I was talking to somebody, if you're lacking money and you want to invest, now you know if that's how you can, you don't have a side hustle and that's how you want to make money, that's great. Research that topic, find out resources, read up on it, get educated, and then go about doing it, right? Don't attend a conference, spend $1,000 just because you will feel because Tony Robbins said or Gary, uh, Gary V said, then this is something that is going to make you more educated on a particular topic or is gonna, you're going to invest in yourself. You're going to probably invest in them. The idea is that you can start small very easily at home, at your office, and get a lot of value out of it, especially with the amount of knowledge that we have at our disposal. Um, lastly, execute. I, I can't iterate that enough. I seriously can't, can't iterate that enough. It's just, if I push on something, it's just execute. Don't talk about it. 
don't masturbate to it in your head that I'm going to do it now, I'm going to do it now, I'm going to do it now. Tomorrow I come, I'm going to follow up with all those leads. What about the week next week? Are you still going to be able to follow up with all those leads? No. Systematically work through your process, but most importantly, execute. Somebody once told me, don't try to change 100%. Try to make change 1% a day. By the end of the year, you're going to have 365% change or like percentage change in, in, in your life. Hopefully good one, right? So don't regress as a person. Try to make sure that you're executing, but have a game plan. Because if you don't and you're trying to build a muscle, you're just not going to know what you were doing last week, right? Calculate changes. Have a notebook. Have a goddamn Google spreadsheet, slide, doc, sticky note, freaking a backpack with, with that written on it. That this is what I was doing now. That's how it was working out for me. I'm going to try to make this change and see how it works out for, you, uh, for me. Because if you're not counting, calculating, recording, you don't know if you're progressing, right? Because we're not that smart to be able to kind of keep all those numbers in the first place. Hell, I'm not that even smart to remember what the hell I was talking to somebody on a call or what price I quoted. So I'm pretty sure all that information could get clogged up. Execute, go back to the drawing board, get at it again. There is no many times that you can actually fail, right? So fail forward, go out and do it. It will make for one heck of a story either way. I was reading on LinkedIn the other day. I'm not sure how true it is, but I tried to verify it on my own, and it turns out it is to some extent true. Um, it's a story about the guys who built Angry Birds, and it's that annoying game that people used to play around me on an iPhone 3G or 3GS at that time. And I hated that game because I wasn't able to afford an iPhone at that time, let alone that particular game. Uh, and it's funny because that particular developer of that game I was creating games and he created around 47 games and they all failed and he was depressed and he said, now one more time, I'm going to try to pick one more game. And that 48 turned out to be a billion dollar game and that is Angry Birds. Execute, go back to the drawing board. Whatever path you're on, it's probably is worth it and it's good because if you believe in it, it's going to work, for, it'll work out for you. We don't care what anybody says anyway, right? Fail forward, go out and do it. And yeah, let me know how it went. Thank you. Um, Margaret, you can jump in. Yeah, hi guys again. So we've got several questions here that have appeared during this presentation. And basically, like I've been listening to this from the perspective of a marketing person. Yes, I'm representing the marketing side. And I wonder, like right now as a marketing person in an organization, I'm doing my best to provide the sales department with the sales qualified leads. And I'm thinking exactly if, like basing on your own experience you worked in many different organizations how do you estimate effort of the marketing department that is working hard on inbound effort to provide you with the right type of leads do you see the results mm. here well inbound is because of marketing right i mean it's that simple like dan i think he coined the term marketing uh back in 2012 i think and it was pretty interesting because sales and marketing are just one thing they're just like one pillars of a building yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I do. we do have metrics in place, OKRs, KPIs, numbers in place to be able to understand, of course, how marketing is doing. That's not to say that they're not doing their job well. That's not to say that they're doing overly well and sales is not doing well. How we do it, and this is pretty basic. So I want you, like, like I said before, this is something that we do. We, of course, see the number of leads that come to us, and our biggest conversion is demo requests. So we take a look at those demo requests that come in, and out of which we have two number, two KPIs. MQL, so marketing qualified leads, and second, SQL, sales, excuse me, SALs, sales accepted leads. Now, the difference between an MQL and an SAL is that MQL is any lead that has shown interest. If they have asked for a demo request or pricing or to speak to you, have they called you or on call page, they went and put in their number for a callback feature, that means they're interested in having a talk. That's a marketing qualified lead. How we determine the quality of those leads is by doing SALs, which is sales accepted leads, which essentially means is that if that person fits in our ICP, so ideal customer profile, which is very broad, but it's very simple at the same time. It shouldn't be. I will tell you what it shouldn't be rather than what it should be. It shouldn't be a freelancer. It shouldn't be a contact detail that is wrong or details are wrong and it shouldn't be a student, right? Anything other than that, we should totally accept. Is it from a right domain, a right company, from a right country, and unless it's from Gibraltar, which we accept by the way too. The idea is you wanna be able to make sure that they're valid leads, right? So if they're valid, we accept that and they're sales accepted leads. And most of the times, 
out of that, we don't often get a lot of SQL, so sales qualify lead. What happens afterwards is a different story. But at that time, if you look at the ratio of SALs, they keep on increasing. That means our marketing is doing something right. I mean, they're doing something right in order to be able to get those SALs. So if it's a sales accepted lead, whatever happened afterwards, it's for the better of the worse or, or the worse is salesperson's domain, right? Or the sales team's domain. So that's one way, very simple, very naive, very generic way to be able to understand the quality of leads that are coming in in terms from your marketing department. Mm -hmm. And there was also one question about how to actually understanding the needs of your potential customers. So probably you just pick up the leads somewhere on site, maybe at conferences, and you are thinking, how can you understand what exactly they want in, in this particular moment? Uh, what kind of questions are you asking the leads at the initial content when they know nothing about you, they probably want to find out more, but more importantly, they want to be asked questions about their own needs. What is like yeah. kind of this exploratory questions you are using every time you're contacting prospects? Uh, what I always do, and this is something very common practice in the sales world, answer a question by asking a question. It's that simple for a salesperson, right? Just try to listen. Like sim very basic question is that how can I help you? What I'm looking for, and I still haven't gotten that answer, Said, I have $20 in my pocket. This is the service you provide. Can you do that for me for $20? That's what I'm looking for, simple as that. I am a gun for hire, to put it very bluntly. A gun in this way would be a metaphor for sales, right? So I'm a person that has some knowledge for sales, certain amount of experience in, in sales, and I happen to be, our company happens to be doing very well, right? So the whole idea is that I'm here and I am a consultant, like you mentioned, I have my own company. I try to be able to always understand what exactly are you looking for? Because if you're looking for somebody to cold call, I'm not it. If you're looking for somebody to close your deals, I'm not it. So what I try to do is that I'm not trying to look for what they're looking for. I try to find out what they're not looking for. And then I can cross that off my list and say, hey, I'm not it, I'm not it, I'm not it. But indeed, if you are looking for somebody who's not going to revolutionize your sales, but build up on your sales and try to make it better, at least, well, you know, a little bit and have like a systematic system in place that is that is, you know, involved in incremental growth. Like I'm your guy. I can talk to your salespeople. I can have a look in your sales process. I can try to see what your company is doing from an outsider perspective which a lot of times, especially in Poland, in our small community, is exactly what is needed because people are so close to their product and companies. We all pour our blood and sweat in it. That's fine. That's okay. It's okay to be personal about it. But it's always good to be able to get an outsider perspective and see maybe they will point out something that you haven't noticed. And, of course, that might be a difference between $100 sales versus $200 sales, right? You want to be able to take a look at that. So I try to make sure... I ask people what exactly they're not looking for and you know that's rather than what they're looking for and I'm I'm not it, right? So basic questions could be anywhere from like I'm this, this is exactly what I do. What have you done in the past that has worked for you? What have you not done yet? And let's see if what have you not done, maybe I can fill up one of those gaps there. All right. So I've been thinking right now about basically if some companies are already using some kind of a software or they are already using some service of another company. Um, and you are calling them and you're trying to sell them exactly similar type of service and you want them to buy this service or this product. How do you convince these people that they have to switch? Because switching is very painful. It's difficult. If you've been uh -huh. using a tool for like five years or even one year, or maybe even two months, then it's much more difficult to switch to another tool if like in this kind of situations. How, what kind of arguments are you using to convince these people? And what the is key the most critical aspect here? Sure. Um, the key is that I never asked anybody to switch. Frankly speaking, if you were to ask me about my competitors, I wouldn't be able to tell you much about them. Why? Because I really don't care. If somebody's focused on my competitor, I would tell them this. Go ahead and give it a try and see how it works. Right? It's like Tesla. <laughs> I mean, if you have a Tesla, why would you go ahead and try a different electric car when Tesla happens to be the best in the world in this particular field, right? So if I ever do an app on approach in where I'm asking somebody to switch or where I, my intention is to get somebody to switch, excuse me, um, well, that would be pretty simple. Is that what is it that you're bringing to the table that is going to give them more value? Like simple as that. I, Because if you're cold calling them or reaching out to them, there's a very high chance that you're doing it for your own gain, for your own purposes. I don't try to do that. I try to learn more about their business. 
right? Like, what exactly is it that you do? I see that you're a VP of sales. Damn, you manage 12 people. How is it working out for you? It must be really tough, right? Are they all in one location? Or are they different spread out? That's okay. That's great. So if you spread out, how often do you travel to one another, right? How exactly do you maintain the company culture? So the talk started very basic. Like I mentioned in my presentation or webinar, was that human process, human engagement. Try to be more human rather than somebody, ah, I am from Presley. I have a PR and communication software. We help you connect you to influencers with your content. Um, uh, would you be interested? I noticed on your profile because I have similar web or I have Ghostry or some other tool that you're using an XYZ tool. I would love to be able to find out what exactly you're looking for and are that tool working out for you. Everybody pitches that way. What is it unique you can bring to the table? And in this world, what we can do is, is a two-way street, right? You want to be able to learn more about their business, pay more interest. I will give you an example. Like there was somebody who wanted somebody something from me. I think it was a it was a speech or something. And he kept on liking my posts on LinkedIn and Facebook to a point that I got really happy because these endorphins popping in my brain. Somebody's liking my crap, right? But like somebody once said, you know, at the bottom, we're all apes. Ape see, ape do, right? Like we're all monkeys. We get excited with that kind of crap. So like that really got me his attention. He was praising and I said, I said, okay, dude, I want to talk to you about this. Let's do it. That speech turned out to him pitching his product and that product turned out to be our product in, in HubSpot. It's a great way of doing it. Give value to the person. Your first goal should not be at switching. Your first goal should be building a relationship. You may never know who they might tell to. And I can tell you, I have gained a lot more business that way with the word of mouth and just being nice, polite, and human than just cold e calling or cold emailing people. So the idea is give value first, then look for a return. Yeah, and just relating to the words you, you just said, uh, basically the entire told that uh, in case of HubSpot, they also don't care about their competitors. They don't care about active campaign. They don't care about you know, a labor or whatever. They, they just want to attract the right type of a customer so that this customer comes, buys this product, uh, uses this subscription and is not dissatisfied because the worst thing would be just to attract the wrong type of customer where you would see the person who is always complaining, who is not satisfied with the with this particular platform and who is living and spreading the world like, you know, bad comments, bad opinions about about the company. Unfortunately. This seems to be the worst, worst part. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like what I always do is that if you, if you can filter out those people, that is great. I'm not sure how you can filter those out, right? Like the whole idea is just try to make sure if it's a very sales intensive workplace, then it's easier to kind of qualify them. But if you have a subscription base, which is you don't really need a lot of salespeople, and it's pretty hard to filter those people out, right? Like the best thing you can do is just be nice and just let them be on the way. Yeah. All right, so let, let's move to the questions here that were written by people. Um, so um, if someone is not like is not engaged, how do you re-engage these prospects, these leads? Uh, what kind of channels are you using to reach them back and make them like get interested again? Okay, well, I think the super important, I think this is something that is, it's, it's something that is called, it's a phenomenon called salesperson's jail is that if you start talking on an email, they're going to continue to expect only receive an email from you. They won't expect a phone call because you did not take it there. You didn't take your relationship there as morbid as it may sound. So the whole idea behind that is that you define the territories that, that you can contact them. I, on my side, I contact typically in three places. That is email, that is phone call, that is LinkedIn. So I connected them on LinkedIn right away. If they have a LinkedIn, if they don't, that's fine. But my first way of qualification, I don't think qualification, qualification excuse me, happens over email. It always happens over a phone call or should happen over a phone call. It's a human involved. There's, you know, you can give rebuttals quickly. You can talk better. There is a better flow of information that is happening from both ends. So it's easier that way. So I try always try to make sure that I'm calling them and qualifying them. So you have to determine where those territories are, where the red line is, or so-called line in the sand is in terms of where they can contact you or where you can get in touch with them, right? So all this you have to make sure that you're using various different things because email is gonna happen. Intercom will happen to some extent, right? But telephone call, telephone is super important. And of course, if there's a social media aspect to it, do that, that is super important, especially with, um, with people who like or are engaged in social media, right? You're gonna just gonna get a bonus point for just liking their stuff or just being engaged there or giving them value there. But let's say if somebody's, excuse me, not to, you're not, they're not engaged with you and you haven't really defined that territory, it gets pretty difficult if you reach out on LinkedIn, right? 
kind of shows a lot of desperation. It also, in some points, shows a little bit of uniqueness. It also, in some points, shows a lot of initiative as well. It depends on a person to person. I really haven't gauged it or calculated it enough to see which platform works better for me. Phone and email work the best in LinkedIn. Works very good if I need it to work very good. The idea is that you determine the place you need to contact. But what the biggest opportunity salespeople miss, and that is, again, I will bring back to the point, they just want to finish that call and go, yeah, in two weeks, I'm going to get a sale. No, in two weeks, you're going to get an answer. You might or might not get an answer. But hey, while you're on the call, what, when do you think I will get an answer from you? I think, say, 21st of August is when I will give you an answer. You know what? I'll put on some time on 22nd of August in your calendar right now, so I will give you a call. Now, the call is in their calendar. They just had a fresh call with you. They remember you. They don't have their life problem. They accept your call, and the notification pops up automatically, and they, you know, they accept your call. If it's a Zoom call, they do that. If it's a goddamn, I don't know, other platform you're using, they're going to accept that as well and just go on there and have a call with you. So the idea is you determine the next step to the moment you let it go off uh, before you go off on, 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 on a single call, be that be qualification, be, a, be that be a demo. So yeah, you have to kind of like set those those parameters out with, with the particular customer, excuse me, prospect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question was about cross-selling. So shouldn't cross-selling be a CS responsibility? If it works for you, go ahead and write and do it. But there is cross-selling that is pre-customer. There is cross-selling that is post being a customer. All right. I mean, if uh, I if somebody is your is your is a prospect that comes to you and says, you know, I have a I, I have a need that is particular, right? It's always good to analyze their pain points, ask more questions, understand more. Sure, I'm looking to track people that come on my website to see what they can do. But would it be worth it for you to have their email addresses as well? Should you have any question? Well, you know, say it might be a very good idea. Also, do you think it would be a good idea for you to see if they drop off on your phone somewhere? Well, geez, I didn't think about it, but it seems like a fine, nice idea. Okay, that's good too, right? So the idea is not that you restrict yourself to this because, hey, I'm a customer success manager. It's my job. No, it's our customer, everybody's customer. And if you can get more value to that person and in the meantime, do good for yourself because you're going to sell somebody that is going to get more value, you're going to get more money, so you're going to have a customer that is more invested in your product, that's a win-win. I don't see why it needs to be a restriction towards only a salesperson or a customer success person, right? Mm -hmm. And do you use OKRs? Uh, yes, objective key results. Yes, I think everybody does. I have a unique way of having these OKRs. I'm obsessed with them, so I kind of like update them on a daily basis to see how I'm doing. Yes, we use OKRs. Yes, any salesperson should use OKRs. I think everybody should use OKRs because if you don't have an objective and if you don't have key results to match those object objectives, excuse me, then you will not know how you progressed a week, a month, a year down the line, right? If you can, and I, if I can take a look at the results 2017, I'll give you a use case. Like we had a drop off and demo request uh, a month back, I think it was July. And it was because I thought it was probably because, you know, it was summer, people are off, they don't, you know, they're not very engaged. But then we looked at the data from 2017. It was the best month we had for demos in 2017. Which right away, it was a hypothesis in my head, but it kind of became, it was incorrect right away because it wasn't true because last year it was, it was different. And the year before that, it was a good month as well. So maybe this year there was some kind of a drop off that we don't know about. We will investigate and I'm pretty sure we'll find the reasons, but it's always good to have that information that that's what I was doing a year ago. So I was benching 120 and now I'm benching 180. So my strength grew by 60 pounds, right? So the, that's the idea to track. Go see what you're doing, how it was, and where you're going to go. How are you doing now? Yeah, and the last question. Are you using Asana or Wunderlist or any other related tools? Oh, yeah. I actually have it on my computer right now. I use Wunderlist. Um, I think they're all kind of the same tools. They fulfill the same need because all I need is a pretty simple tool to write what I need to do. And I, I'm so fast with what I'm writing because I just need to write it. And then I need to visualize it. So I write it down and put on a reminder. It needs to be done at that particular time in a day or it needs to be done tomorrow and I'm good to go. Uh, so the only thing is that I, I dislike about myself and I'm a victim of this is that they have to snooze them continuously because I'm like something pops up and I have to I don't do them. And then two days later, I go, shoot, I mean, it's still pending. 
So the idea is that if somehow there's a tool that could freeze my computer as soon as a as soon as a thing pops up and I have to do that, that would be great. But for now, I just I my game plan is wonderless. End of story. Okay, so it's, thank you a lot for coming here and delivering your presentation. Oh, uh, thank to you those who wanna wanna receive this presentation, all the emails will be sent, so we'll get the access to the video and also we'll get to the access to the presentation of Syed as well. So thank you for today and oh, see you. Just bye. bye.